Hello, hello, welcome. What's going on, everybody? Give it a quick second here. Hi, it's Sam Barker here from the Oh my goodness. Behind me. Always got stuff going off in the background. How's everybody doing? Uh, welcome. Happy Friday, end of the weekend. Although I usually work the weekends, always trying to create stuff for you guys. Um, you guys, a lot of you probably work the weekends too, so you know what's up with that. Um, let me know what you got going on this weekend in the comments. If you're somebody who wants to jump over to the comments this weekend, I'm celebrating my uh girlfriend's birthday so we've both been super stressed with the move and getting everything packed and she's got a lot more stuff going on than i do so i just want to try and make a you know a nice relaxing weekend for her something to you know look forward to um so i'm very much looking forward to that taking a few days off so let me know if you guys got anything fun planned for this weekend i know it's kind of tough with the uh the new normal if you will um, but hey, if you're doing anything fun or creative, uh, feel free to let me know. That would be cool to do. Um, let's see. We got watching from Afghanistan, Marcus Jones, Marcus. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, and cool. So how do you win one? Yep. We're going to be getting to that. So the topic for today, uh, that we'll be covering and focusing on is how do you actually win a government contract? Um, so, so much of my content is, I should say all of my content mostly is is focused around things you need to do to actually win a contract. But sometimes it's easier to kind of just talk about it plainly without going into all the details. Um, there's probably a lot of folks uh, that already know how to actually win the contract, but you might want to hear, you know, my version of it, my definition and some things that you need to know and what you can actually do to truly win a government contract. What does that actually mean? So that's gonna be the focus for today's uh, this, today's video. Um, Anonymous says, maybe use Shopify or Alibaba. Yeah, I, I really try to distance myself from the drop shipping method. Um, uh, I can get to that when we get to the, the questions. Um, I'm focused on building a, a you know, I, I recommend and teach and uh, encourage to, to focus on building long-term businesses that are, are truly something you can hang your hat on um it really seems to be the range right now all the rage to do the the fulfillment by amazon thing um quite frankly i don't recommend it for govcon um it's kind of a fly-by-night type uh thing not saying it won't be here in the future but it's just not at all what i recommend for uh government contracting from what i've seen be successful it's not necessarily a long-term a strategy, a long-term thing, but that's not really the topic at all. Just respond to that comment. Hey, looking forward to hearing your advice, David Daniel. Also, welcome. Thanks for dropping in. So um, I think we've had enough time now for anybody who wants to join to join. We'll probably have some folks come in around the one o'clock session. Uh, we'll go to 1.30 as usual. Um, if you're new, I'll kind of give you the layout. And then if you're returning, let me know in the comments if you've seen, been here on another uh, YouTube live, this is our third and we're kind of going strong. I, I like to do um, things for you guys, but only if it's valuable for you. So I'm kind of testing these out and this is our third session. I'm super excited and hopefully it's, it's bringing value to you, getting questions answered. Uh, Pam Knighton, hello, welcome. Um, so for those of you who are new, this is your first YouTube live. Uh, very special welcome. Uh, the way that this is going to work is I'm going to cover the topic that is associated for today, which is how do you actually win a government contract? You know, I just kind of touched on that. What does it look like? What do you need to do? Um, when you have questions, if your questions are related to the topic, um, just drop those because we do seem to get a good amount of questions. Just drop those as I'm talking and I'll browse over and look at those. If you have other government contracting related questions, kind of save those for towards the end because we usually do have a bit of time to fill. And so I just don't want to go too far off topic. So if I read a, uh, one of your comments and it's a question that's uh, GovCon related, but it's not related to today's topic, I'll just save that for the end, just so you know. Uh, Marshall Morris, also, what is up? Thanks for joining. So without further ado, we're about almost five minutes in. Let's talk about it. This is a fun topic. Um, 
how do you actually win a contract? Here you go. To win a contract, you have to receive an actual contract obligation award. Okay, we're going to start high and we're going to kind of back into it. I got a few notes here on my screen, bullet points that I wanted to walk through. So we're going to start at this starting point. You, you may not even know this. Maybe you do. You have to receive a contract action obligation award, which is a little, literally a piece of paper, a document signed by the contracting officer, made out to your company. Usually it's uh, a response to a, a, you know, an RFP or an RFQ that you responded to before that. So we're going to back into the steps here. So um, until you have that piece of paper, until you actually have the award, it says awarded to your company, ABC LLC. Okay, it's a tangible thing. That is the award. That doesn't mean you get the, the money up front. It doesn't mean, you know, there's a piece of paper with a check attached to it. It's not that. But what it is, is the contract obligation. And contracting officers, you know, they're licensed to obligate funds. So, you know, certain contracting officers have different levels of um, certification, compliance. I don't know the exact thing because I've never been a contracting officer. Um, but I know that there's different state tests that allow them to obligate funds, which means um, whoever is signing your award is the person who can obligate that amount of money. The bigger the dollar amount for your award, uh, the higher up it needs to go. And that's kind of where simplified acquisition thresholds, simplified acquisition procedures, you know, that's usually something folks talk about a lot about as we, you know, kind of learned last week um, from the help of one of our, uh, our group members here, the, the simplified acquisition threshold is now up to 250,000. So an award under 250 is going to need less kind of uh, oversight and stamp of approval. Um, the, the process is not as complicated than an award over $250,000. So just know that as a, ca a caveat but we're getting started with the award. You will get an email from a contracting officer. The subject line is probably going to say award or something like that. And they're going to say, you know, congratulations, or, you know, fortunately you were the winning bidder. Um, they're going to attach that award. You want to save that off into, you know, your, your folder structure hierarchy in your computer. Make sure you don't lose that. It'll be in your email, but save that off. That's going to be your, your golden piece of paper there. So that actually is an award. And usually you don't get to see one of those until you win an award or somebody, um, you know, shows you theirs or whatever. It's not like a certificate of excellence with a golden star or anything like that. It's like a letter and it could be a, a couple pages. It could just be one page, but it's going to have the dollar amount also in it that, you know, you propose and you won under. It's going to have your cage and your duns, all your company information, all that. So if, if we're good with that, um, that's kind of where we're starting. You need to receive that thing. That is the award. I've never really heard anybody break it down to the nitty gritty like that. So that's one of the things I wanted to do on this live session is tell you, hey, that it's a thing. This is what's on it. This is what it looks like. Until you have that, you don't have an award. I don't care if you got a phone call or if you have a relationship that says, yeah, you got the award or you're getting the award. You don't. I've been in that situation where I was told I'm getting the award or I got the award, but then I never received it. And then, you know, I was excited, but I was going crazy because I didn't get that particular award in my email. I didn't have it in my inbox. Come to found out they changed their mind last minute and they, uh, they gave it to another company. So until you have that thing, again, you do not have the award. Once you do have it, you can 100% bank that it's your award. The only thing that can happen, sometimes other companies can protest, which means uh, the award is not necessarily taken back from you. But if you if you won and the other companies that were bidding against you, they lost and they didn't think that you're, you, know, you won fairly or that there was kind of something wrong with the procurement process, this is something they could do against you or you could do against them is you could file a protest. We're not going to get into the ins and outs of that because we're going to move on here in just a second to talking more about, you know, how to actually win a contract. But um, this is one thing that can freeze. They'll actually freeze the award. So you won't be performing on the contract until this protest 
kind of gets figured out. So there's going to be some scrutiny. There, there may be the inspector general that gets involved. Um, lawyers may get involved. Stuff like that can happen and does happen all the time if there's a controversial award made to a company. So that could happen to you or you could be, you know, one company that you know that the person who won that, the, the small business owner or the small business that won that, you know, they did something shady or something wrong or there's favoritism or whatever. You have grounds to file a protest. So it would, it would freeze that award until the further investigation can take place. And then um, based on the determination of that, at that point, they could take the award back. They may have to just recompete, you know, throw it all up in the air and, you know, say, screw it. We got to do this thing all over again. It does happen. Um, or it could be fined, uh, found to be fine. And in which case it will just continue to go um, you know, to the company it was awarded to and uh, nothing will really change. But the period of performance will not begin until that process is over, just so you know. It will be frozen if you're if you're originally supposed to start tomorrow. You won't be able to start tomorrow until this whole thing is is uh, over, which means the government customer will be the one to suffer. They will not be able to get the service that they need. It's what happens. Usually what they'll do is they'll just keep the contractor on who was already doing the work. Um, if it was something like delivering a good, though, they'll just have to go without. So that's, um, you know, I, I went a little bit more on uh, than I wanted to about uh, the whole protest thing, but I've never talked about it before. So I, I figured I would just spend a minute talking about that. But back to how do you win a contract? Okay, we, we know what is award now. We know what that is and what that looks like. And only once you receive it. So again, kind of step two here. How do you go about getting that? There's one thing that you must do that you can never get around. Some folks try to take an easier way to get around this thing that I'm going to tell you. And um, you just can't. So you might as well develop the skill. You might as well just get used to doing it. Because if you don't do this one thing, you will never win a, a contract. And if you're trying to get into GovCon, you're trying to win contracts, you have to do this one thing. So the one thing is you have to be able to respond to an RFP or an RFQ. Go figure. I'm sorry. It's not sexy. It's not it's maybe something you haven't heard already, but there's nothing sexy about this whole process. There's nothing magical. We just had a, a, a group, um, two folks, and I think they might be married, um, the clouds uh, yesterday, last night, they posted, I uh, was speaking with them. Uh, they just won two contracts. Um, so they're celebrating that in the group. So you're never going to be able to be like them and, and win a contract or like any business that's winning contracts uh, with, without being able to respond to an RFP or an RFQ, a request for proposal or a request for quote. These are both one solicitation and a solicitation can either be an RFP or it can be an RFQ. Don't get too caught up in that. Just know they're going to ask you for a proposal with pricing or they're going to ask you for a quote. You have to respond to that to win an award. You have to, even if it's a sole source, even if there's no competition, it's a directed award. You know, it's a relationship. I met somebody at a conference and they're going to give me, you know, an award. They're going to give me a contract. Cool. Awesome. I'll be right next, you know, right next to you celebrating and cheering. But what they're going to do is they're going to email you the solicitation and you still have to respond to it. You can't get around responding to it because they still need their paper trail. They can't just short circuit the acquisition process because they want to give you a, a contract. Okay. People will lose their jobs and heads will roll. Um, they need to be able to prove that you are the best qualified bidder. And that's either through a lowest price acquisition, a best value, you know, procurement strategy, or because you're just the best company and you're kind of the only one who can do it. So the government's going to issue either a sole source or a directed award with a justification and approval uh, to basically state and you know, they'll write that up on behalf of your company to say ABC LLC is the best company for the job. We did our market research and we found they are the only ones who can provide X service or X product or maybe, 
you know, sometimes they'll do this with like a, an OEM, like an original equipment manufacturer, like, Hey, we want John Deere. We're going to John Deere. We do not want any equivalents. So they will issue this justification, you know, for a directed award or a sole source to John Deere because nobody else makes John Deere except for John Deere. You know, John Deere is a large business, you know, fortune 500 S you know, S and P 500, you know, uh, Dow Jones, whatever stock exchange they're on. So they wouldn't do that, but you get my point. If, if you are a company, we had a, a, a fellow in the group, I believe he's a soldier, um, in the Facebook group, he has some, some thing that he can do to, I forget exactly what it was, but I believe it was on their, on their vehicles. He was saying, Hey, this is something I can do for like a hundred dollars and everywhere else, the government, you know, is charging 800 to a thousand dollars to do it. He posted in the group, uh, kind of a, like a live video earlier this week. That's an example of, Hey, if he can do this in a kind of like a different way, um, he could be a candidate for that. However, in, as my response to him, he, he'll need somebody to champion him on the inside, you know, uh, you know, cause say the customer wants him to do it, but the customer, which is usually like a government PM or a government engineer, somebody who's actually using it, using these vehicles, they still have to go to contracting. So they would have to take this uh, individual, get him a meeting, maybe with contracting behind the scenes, say, Hey, he's got a unique way to do this. That's, you know, one tenth of the cost and the quality is just as good, if not better. And with that being said, um, if all that went well, contracting would still issue him probably an RFQ, a request for quote to uh, fix these these pieces on the vehicles, on the fleet that they have. Um, and so he would still have to go through that response. So again, kind of number two we're talking about right now. Number one was the award is a tangible thing. Number two is the one thing you can't get around doing that you might as well learn. The one skill you need to develop is responding to an RFP or RFQ. You have to have a way to communicate to contracting, you know, what your pricing is, you know, and, and how are you going to do it? And in some cases, why it should be you. That's where past performance or technical approaches get brought in. Other times it can be just pricing, you know. So let me just uh, let that sink in. Let me catch my breath here for a second. Folks, I get I get the question occasionally or maybe slightly, slightly more than occasionally. Like, I don't want, I don't know how to do RFPs. I don't know how to do RF, RFQs. I don't know how to respond to it. Well, you have to, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm I'm trying. I'm trying to be here to help. You know, I, I have a number of uh, videos that I walk through. I have a, a couple of courses in the five course series for free right now. Um, I'm currently in the process of working on a lot more in depth tools and resources for you. It's probably going to be six months or so before I release it, but I'll be talking about more about that later. But I will be giving you something very definitive that you could use to respond to RFPs, RFQs, if that is the one thing that's holding you back. But until then, there is some really good material up that is helping others. So at least try to go through that if that's a skill that you're you're um, being stuck with, okay? Or try to get help from some other folks in the group. But if you can't do that, wh what are you gonna tell a government customer? We got an award for you, you know, here's a solicitation, you know, give us your response. You're gonna say no? I mean, you, you're not going to turn away a contract. You're going to figure it out. So that's kind of the, the next thing that I, I wanted to touch on. Um, let me just check the comments. We do have some folks jumping in. As I said earlier, any comments um, that are not related to this topic, I will try to get to at the end of the, the live here. Anything that's relevant to what we're covering right now, I'll try to pull in right away. So let me go ahead and see what we have here. Past performance. Uh, Theotis Brown, this is very beneficial information. Thank you, Theotis. Uh, sh shout out to uh, East LA. Can I get paid up front? We'll talk about that. Thanks for doing the live stream. Any thoughts for the Shipley process? Uh, Harry Monroe, yeah, I can kind of tie this comment in. Um, thanks for doing the live stream. Any thoughts on the Shipley process? 
I have a little bit of experience uh, with the Shipley process. I'm not Shipley certified. Um, the Shipley process is kind of the, for those of you who don't know, which may be most of you, the Shipley process is kind of the, the gold standard. Um, when you hear Shipley, it's what you think of. Um, if you know it, what it is, is it's a, a process for putting together proposals, essentially. That is the, the most, um, I don't want to say thorough, but I'll say the most thorough. And basically, it's like the, the best method for putting together proposals. Um, just in a nutshell, without going into any more detail, it's the where you go to put together proposals. Um, and you're asking, what is my my commentary on that? My commentary is mixed because, of course, it's great. But for small business owners, um, let me see. Yeah. Yeah. Harry, for for small business owners who are kind of trying to win their first contract, which is really you know, first or our first few, we're talking very small, less than a million dollars in revenue. The Shipley process could be overwhelming, uh, overwhelming and overkill sometimes um, because it, it could really, if you just blindly take the Shipley process and say, you know, doing all these compliance matrices, matrices and, and all these other things, it could be very overkill because you have to learn to read first in the solicitation, that RFP or the RFQ, you have to learn to read it first. You have to crawl before you can walk. You have to walk before you can run. And you need to, to be able to extract from that the information that you need to put in that solicitation in order to respond and, and, and get that award, you know, today's topic. Um, if you're just kind of blindly going with the, the Shipley process, it, it could give you something much bigger and something much more. Um, than necessarily what contracting wants. Oftentimes, it'll be a five to 10 page not to exceed limit and using the Shipley process or the Shipley method, from what I know, it could often be much larger than that. Now, like I said, I'm not an expert in Shipley, so I could be missing a few things here, but uh, Shipley is, is very good. And for businesses that really want to get into writing extensive and thorough proposals, um, it might not be a bad thing, although the other caveat is I haven't seen, and this could be my own ignorance, but I haven't seen it tailored to actually government contracts. And maybe it absolutely does have that. But what I've seen, I've seen it tailored as kind of like an overall business proposal type thing that I see people uh, kind of customize and use for, for government contracts, but also contracts in the, uh, the, the business world, the commercial world. Um, so that's the other caveat. You know, I wouldn't want somebody using something that's not 100% government contracting. So um, that's kind of my thoughts on that. That's a good question, uh, unique question. Um, anybody who wants to go check out the uh, the Shipley method, the Shipley process, just type that into Google, and um, they'll you'll see that they're kind of the the front runner, the the gold standard for you know proposals. But that's kind of my thoughts about that as it relates to really small businesses and trying to get your first couple government contracts. And then just the GovCon industry in general, my thoughts as it relates. So um, let me get back on track here. I um, was glad that we could address that question as it relates to today's topic. Um, I did touch on this a little bit, just checking my notes. Um, so award, right, it's a tangible thing. And then uh, the one skill you need to develop is being able to respond to an RFP or uh, an RFQ, a solicitation, okay? So kind of next is, and I already touched on this, so I won't spend a whole lot of time, but where where do you go about responding to that, you know, that RFP, RFQ? Well, you either get it on beta.sam.gov. They're posted publicly for free. Beta.sam.gov, toggle to contract opportunities. Um, go to the, uh, the notice types, select solicitation and combined synopsis solicitation. And you'll have a list of however many tens or hundreds of thousands of solicitations, RFPs, RFQs that you could respond to. So, I mean, that's one place that you can find them. And, you know, once you have it, go ahead and respond to it. And then maybe you get an award. We're going back up the chain here. Um, like I said, we're going to back into this. So um, where do you go from, you know, okay, responding to it? Well, before that, you've, you've got to find it. So that's why I'm touching on this. 
You can go to beta.sam to find them, or you can get them from relationships. So um, let me just, yeah, I've got my audio visual person making sure I didn't have any uh, audio issues here, <laughs> checking my text. Um, you can also get it through relationships. So where do you go to get these solicitations, RFPs, RFQs? You can get them on beta.sam.gov or you can get them through developing relationships. Everything I talk about and everything I'm always gonna talk about forever, kind of the one thing that's never gonna go away is like the three pillars of, of doing your GovCon business. You know, first off, you have to register it, get that out of the way, never talking about it again, you know, and then you need to market and bid, right? You have to be marketing, marketing intelligently, and then, and then bidding consistently, bidding during those busy times. So that's where it really comes from. Uh, where are you going to get these solicitations? You're going to bid for them, look for them on beta.sam or through marketing, you're going to get them through relationships. So that's why marketing and bidding goes hand in hand with where are you getting these RFPs to respond to? Because if you're not, you're not responding to them. And then if you're not doing that, you're not winning contracts. So it, it all builds, right? I hope you see that this all builds in very basic steps um, and you have to learn these skills. So beta.sam, I'm gonna say it a million times, look for the RFPs, that's where they are. You don't need to pay to get on a GSA schedule. Okay, you don't have to go and like get GovTribe or some of these other websites. Um, if you don't want, especially the paid ones, if they're free and you like the value that they offer, maybe they can help you with the searches. Hey, go nuts, whatever is best for you, honestly, whatever's best for you is what I want. Um, whatever works best for you. But when it comes to paying for stuff, I question the value add. And then I just kind of recommend you to learn to get a little bit better at setting up your own searches in beta.sam.gov. And then with building relationships, it's, it's the same thing. It never goes away, right? You need to market to contracting officers. You need to market to the small business offices, Ozdaboos, okay? You need to respond to source of salt market research. This is a form of marketing. You send your capability statement, you get your hat in the ring. And you can also attend government contracting conferences at your target agencies. This is how you market. This is who you market to. This is what you do. You don't need to keep endlessly searching for, for new things to do. Like there's a very short list of things that you need to do. The problem is people are very uncomfortable with that. So they try to mentally check out and, and chase other things like, oh, when I do this, this will make it. And when I do this, it's like being a rat on the wheel. No, <laughs> do these things, do these four things to market and then do this one thing called bidding. You have five activities to focus on, five bullets, one, two, three, four, five. Source of sought, market to contracting, market to the Ozdaboos, uh, GovCon conferences and, and bidding. That's what you need to do. You can't really get around that. I mean, the conferences, they also have a grain of salt because go to those conferences, attend those conferences, play full out at those conferences with your target agencies. But when it comes to conferences at places you know nothing about, um, conferences that you're not focused on, don't waste your time, don't waste your money, especially. But the ones that are at those agencies that you're looking to do business with, play full out and tend those. You can even get one one on one with somebody who's really, uh, you know, an, an Ozdaboo person, small business liaison or a contracting officer. You can get a really good one on one with them, get one follow up meeting, which is probably more important. So you can get a meeting by yourself with those folks. Um, that's going to be extremely beneficial to you. That'll make the, that whole conference worth it. Um, but don't just go to those things to pass out your CAPE statements and try to do spam marketing, shake hands, get a bunch of business cards, come home, and now you've got all this crap in a bag and and you didn't have any meaningful contacts or meaningful conversations. I've done it dozens of times and it's just a waste of time. So don't even do that. Go there with the intent. That's why I'm saying of the five activities, this conference thing is going to be what you make it. It could be a waste of time or it can be one of the most beneficial things you can do. So um, again, uh, I always try to bring psychology into this, the, the, the mental the mental game, the mental battle. My, my heart's with you guys. I understand. 
I understand it's intimidating. I understand there is a, a knowledge gap and that's, I'm, I'm working to bridge that. I'm not done. I'm still making, I've got new stuff in the works for you guys. I'm not done yet. So I know that there's a knowledge gap. I hate that um, the industry makes it so ridiculously uh, overwhelming and complicated and intimidating. And some folks will, will prey on you and say, if you do this wrong, you're going to jail. Like, hey, I mean, I'm not saying you, you should be doing stuff wrong. And if you do that, you're, there's not going to be consequences. But you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to hold back. You just need to educate yourself. And I'm here to tell you that you can do it. And I, I hate that they, they make things so ridiculous. Um, I'm trying to be a light to take the darkness away and show you like, hey, this, this is what it is. Okay, it's not easy. It takes hard work. And this is realistically what you can expect. Is this for you? It might be or, or it might not be. Like, but hey, at least you should have the right to make the decision. You shouldn't be going into something blindly with somebody's false expectations in your head only for you to find out in six months or a year and a half or two years that this whole thing was not what you thought it was, okay? I, I, I'm trying to take that away. This thing is a great opportunity, right? But it has to be a match. It has to be a match for you. I don't know what you have going on in your life. I don't know what your cash flow situation looks like. I don't know what your long-term plans are. I don't know what your current level of skills and abilities are to be able to get into government contracting because maybe there's some stuff you have to learn. You have to take personal inventory. I mean, you have to have some, you know, come to Jesus conversations, you know, with yourself. Really find out if this is something you seriously want to do because if you do, it's a seriously good opportunity. But the problem is a lot of folks, they, they hear stuff you know, if you heard something from a friend or colleague or you read something online or you watched a video, um, even one of my videos, like you can't just take that with itself. You have to put the blinders on and see what's best for you. So, again, I just, you know, again, I love my soapboxes. Right. But um, my heart goes out to you that it, it makes making the decision and, and learning this stuff so difficult. So, you know, it's, it's my whole mission to just make it easier um, and I know I've got a long way to go as a consultant and a coach. The more feedback you can give me is the more I can help you. So um, that's, yeah, let me get off my soapbox now. Um, the relationship part, uh, the way you, you know, we've kind of already touched on it. I, I don't really want to backtrack it. The relationship part and finding the bids. That's, that's those five steps. That's what we just went through, guys. Um, one thing, though, just checking my notes that can make it. And we did already touch on it a little bit. Simplified acquisition procedures um, and the SAT, which is the simplified acquisition threshold. Um, this can make things, you know, a little bit, I don't want to say easier or more difficult, but it's just, again, it's the level of oversight changes. There's this line in the sand. Last year, it used to be 150. This year, they raised it to 250 because of COVID. Um, so that's allowing contracting to get stuff done you know, easier and faster and more agile because, you know, our, our nation needs help from us small business contractors and we need it quickly and we need it now because we're, we're under a, you know, nationwide, you know, threat with the virus and whatever else is going on. Um, so they they raise that bar. So contracting can get in there and make those decisions without having to go up the chain, which is just going to, you know, with the government, it's going to make everything, uh, longer and, and, you know, spread out and jobs are not going to get done that need to get done right away. So um, that is what that is. And so if you play under that 250 level, it can make things um, maybe a little bit easier and faster. The thing is, and this question I get all the time, uh, well, how do I find those? Well, you don't. I mean, they don't, they don't tag opportunities as, as simplified acquisition or they typically don't tell you sometimes, but typically say 75% of the time, they will not tell you this is like going to be under 250,000. Sometimes they'll give you what's called a ROM, which is a rough order of magnitude and say, this contract shall not exceed $100,000 or this contract shall not exceed $750,000. So you're like, okay, well, I know that there's a ceiling on it. So if you do see something that has a, a not to exceed number and that's, you know, 250 or under that can, you know, 
give you a clue that this is going to be a, a SAP um, procurement. But other, I mean, you have to even read to find that. And that's not even easy or quick to find that. You have to go into the solicitation docs and, and read it. So unless they put it in the, the body of the beta.sam.gov posting, maybe they'll put that in the, the description before you get into like any other attachments. But other than that, I get this question all the time. You're not going to see it. You can't search them. Um, it's just going to be what you're bidding on. And, and, you know, you should have a gauge based on your level of um, expertise, whatever business you are in, you should have a gauge on what it is you're bidding. So when you read this solicitation, RFP or RFQ, right, you kind of have a ballpark in your head. Like if you're staffing 10 positions, you should know right off the bat, this is not going to be under 250K, you know, or if you're providing a good that's of a certain quantity or you're, you're building a construction, you know, you're doing some construction renovation and there's like five subcontractors that you have to work with, five different trades that you have to work with to, to do it. Or you've got some IT project, but it's going to take you two years to do. OK, none of those are going to be within the SAP. Very, very unlikely just because of the time or or the quantity that it's going to take to do that. So those are the type of indications you need to look for as being the expert in, in your field, because I cannot make you the expert in your field. You're supposed to be bringing a business um, that you can you know, sell goods or services to the government. If you have not done that, you need to do that before you go any further. You, you need to own the thing. I mean, you are the entrepreneur. You are the business owner. I can't make you. Nobody can make you the small business owner. OK, just because you register something, just because you register an LLC that you propped up a month ago does not make you anything. I mean, it just makes you a guy or a girl that has a piece of paper with an LLC or an S corp or a C corp or uh, doing business as or, or whatever, you know, some sort of tax structure is really all you have. You coming back to taking that personal inventory and all that, you have to know what GovCon model you want to do, you know? You know, so we, we talked a bit, someone had a comment about, um, you know, drop shipping. Well, hey, delivering products to the government is fine. OK, it's it's fine. It's been around for a while. But what I what I don't like is when people start talking about Amazon and drop shipping. That doesn't mesh very well with the government. Um, government wants you to hold your prices for 90 days. OK, well, buying stuff on Amazon, you know, doesn't last for 90 days. Oftentimes you can go to get the thing in 60 days and now the thing's gone. Oh, now you're screwed. Now you can't buy it on Amazon. Now you got to buy it for somewhere else for a higher price. Now you're taking a loss. Okay. It's things like that. Why I don't love that. So anytime somebody, you know, if that's what their intention is by the, by the question or the comment, I, I want to try to squash that particular thing. In my opinion, if you want to do it and tell me I'm full of crap, Go ahead. I mean, there's probably certain things that you can do it with. But from what I talk about, having a two to three year plan to build a real business, you know, we're talking about building real businesses here. We're not talking about doing something for eight months, okay, to try to get rich or to suck a few hundred grand out of the government because COVID hit. So now we want to take advantage of and sell all this PPE or something. And then when it's over, we're just going to go away. That you know, this is not the space for that. It's not what I believe in. Um, anybody who wants to to bring that, I will I will gladly squash it. Um, and if you want to go on and do it and and be successful doing that, go for it. It's just not my lane. So um, that's what I'm talking about with this. So um, we have a uh, a guest here. Say hi to my dad. Hi there. <laughs> so um uh yeah living in a camper has its uh its pros and its cons but be moving be moving next uh next month so um let me get back on track here guys let me check the comments it's probably a good chance to break get a drink um lots of comments guys thank you for the comments thank you for joining this is our third youtube live i really appreciate whether you're just uh, silently watching, get, getting value, that's awesome. Or, you know, if you're engaging, that's awesome as well. As I mentioned, um, I'll try to skim through the, the questions and the comments, anything that I can relate to the topic right now, I will. 
and uh, the other comments uh, that are GovCon related, but not on topic. I'll save those for more of the end of the session because, hey, I love talking about GovCon with you guys. So um, we can go off topic at the end of the session. But my chat always um, scrolls as I get new comments. So let me find my place. Please make a video on, on WAF. There's literally nothing out there. Um, got it. Thank you. Th Pam Knighton, uh, thank you for the free courses and material. I completed one this week and reading e the ebook now. Awesome. Pam Knighton, uh, thank you for that. Is CMMC requirements showing on RFQs yet? Um, Fred, is CMMC requirements showing on RFQs yet? Not to my knowledge. Um, and I don't know that it's fully going to, uh, to be honest. Um, if there's anything else you want to add, to that, um, let me let me know. Uh, Steve Dams, is it really possible to win a contract without past performance experience and being a new company? Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll address Steve's comment real fast. Um, is it really possible to win a contract without past proven experience and being a new company? Okay, we're talking about how to win an award. So I will find this to be relevant for this topic. Um, but I cover this a lot. So I'm only going to touch on it really quickly and get back on track. Um, is it really possible? It's absolutely possible. Okay. Um, I tell this story sometimes. I had a, a kid named Shane who, um, he resourceful millennial. I think he was 24 or 25 at the time. Uh, he came to me and he really just wanted to know like the same question. Can I really do this? He already registered in Sam, but he was a investment banker in New York and he kind of, you know, burned out. I think maybe he went to go live back with his parents to get on his feet. And um, he was just asking, can I really do this? And my message to him was, once you are eligible to receive a government contract, you are the only thing that's standing in your way, okay? So that means you can win a contract next week, next month, and three months, okay? Once you're eligible to receive it, which means you you got a, a DNB number, which is gonna be changing uh, in December. They're, I believe they're getting rid of that Dunn's number and they're going to uh, replace it with something else. Hopefully, we'll all just be grandfathered in with that. And then you got to register in SAM and, and have your cage code, okay? Then you are eligible to receive a contract award. Uh, I got a call or an email, rather, 30, uh, 30 days after that from Shane uh, telling me that he had won his first contract to lease some heavy equipment, provide you know excavators, dozers, um, things like that, dump trucks, uh, I believe it was to the, the Army Corps. Um, could be a different customer. If, if Shane ever watches this, I don't remember exactly. But I believe it was the Army Corps to provide that heavy equipment. Okay. That was a, a RFQ. They wanted pricing, you know. So Shane was able to hook up with, you know, Komatsu or Caterpillar. And um, between his management that his company provided and the equipment that the, he was able to lease, that he was able to perform and deliver on that contract. So um, yes, he's really, it's really possible to win a contract without past performance, um, past experience rather, and being a new company because they don't always ask for that as a valuation factor. That's the short answer. Sometimes they just ask for price, okay? Sometimes they'll want a price and the specs to know that you're quoting the right thing. Not everything requires past performance, guys. A lot of it does, but not all of it. So um, that's thanks for that, that question. I hope that helps to shine um, a lot of light onto that. Let me see here. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, Harry, thanks uh, Thanks for that, uh, that question. Um, so let's get back to it now. And, and really, quite frankly, I kind of covered everything that I, I wanted to. The last thing that I have in my notes is those, those five things. Respond to sources sought respond to bids, market to contracting, market to the Ozdaboos, and go to conferences. My focus is on business development activities. I am not an accountant. I am not a lawyer. I'm not a retired contracting officer. I am just a business development guy, just like any of you other. You know, I'm a small business owner, and I focus on business development. That's I don't even call myself an expert, but that's my level of expertise. And I, I found, you know, a mission to to shine a light on this area of government contracting because I don't focus a whole lot on how to register your business. I don't focus a whole lot on on set asides. You know, I don't focus on like 
GSA schedules or, you know, I don't even focus a whole lot on conferences, stuff like that. Those are all well and good with their own different weightings, but I'm trying to focus on things that matter. When you're a small business owner and you're the only employee, right? Some of you may chuckle like, cause that's you, or, you know, you have a team of two or three or five, less than 10, um, even maybe a little bit more than 10. I mean, but we're talking about super small. If you're trying to get into GovCon or you're already in GovCon and trying to figure out what to do next, these five things are what you need to focus on to, to put dirt on that assembly line. I don't know if you guys ever watched Gold Rush. You know, I used to watch Gold Rush all the time. They would go and find that pay dirt. So we got to find the pay dirt. So they always have the, the dozers and the excavators and the dump trucks going out and getting the pay dirt and they feed it into the beast. They feed that dirt into the machine. And they spend so much money on this giant machine. And the whole labor is folks always like fixing the machine because it's always breaking down. But it's worth it because on the other end of that conveyor belt, that machine, it shoots out gold. So they put dirt in and the machine sorts it and then it spits out the gold. And the gold gets, you know, compiled and they have these little moonshine, you know, glass jars of gold at the, the end of the, the day or the end of the run or the end of the season. Um, that's what this is. That's what these five things are. It's your, it's your strategy. It's this whole little snow globe that I want you to live in doing these five things. These five things are going to get you your pay dirt. They are your machine and they are going to spit gold out of the other end. I mean, I don't know if you, hopefully at least, uh, let me know in the comments if you guys have ever seen Gold Rush or am I just sounding crazy right now? Um, these guys went up to Alaska and, you know, a TV crew decided to follow them. So as a, a, a team of one, two, three or five or ten, you need to be focusing on revenue generating activities when it comes to government contracting. And if you're doing commercial stuff in your business, you've got other B2C or B2B going on and you, you're able to like use this as a supplement, that's awesome. Um, but a lot of you, I know you're just trying to go 100% GovCon. This applies to both of those situations, but especially if you're trying to do government contracting, I mean, this is what you need to be doing on a weekly basis. On a weekly basis, you need to be doing these, these five things. And this is, you know, I, I mentioned I'm working on a much bigger project um, I'll have something hopefully in six months or so for you guys. It's going to be a, an actual program, a very large program. It will be like a, uh, it'll be take like, be like taking a college class. Um, and it'll probably be priced like taking a college class. Um, I'm working with some, some folks in the industry and we're putting together what's supposed to be my goal is to be the number one thing that exists in the world for actually focusing on winning government contracts. Um, and it's everything every day, what I'm working towards to bring that to you, because I know you guys are in the trenches and there's very few folks that are out there to truly help. Um, you have a lot of people out there giving bad advice, you know, selling, get rich quick, um, or just giving misinformation. Um, hopefully, you know, you guys know me of standing on a strong foundation and I put all my stuff out there. So, um, you know, that's that's what my goal is to be, to help you with these main things that you really need to be focusing on. And for those of you who want to be distracted and, and say, oh, I don't need to wor worry about those five things. What about this? What you know, what about GSA schedules? What about subcontracting? What about, you know, getting this, this set aside, getting this certification? You don't need it. I'm telling you, you don't need it. It's up to you if you want to listen to me or not. But you don't need it. I'm, I'm telling you what what you need it whether or not you want to do it or not it's not sexy it's pretty simple um but you gotta you gotta do it it's hard work it's the grind so for those of you who are willing to, to take the pledge take the challenge that you're ready to do to do the grind to do the things that are not sexy that is what's going to take you the distance that's what's going to separate you from the pack because to be you know somewhere that other people aren't you have to do the things that are they're not willing to do. So many want to do the things that are attractive, flashy, 
and um, they are not the same. They are not one in the same. Those things are not the things that actually build a business. It's the dirt. It's the ground. It's the grind. This is what layer after layer after layer looks like after 18 months, two years, three years. This is how you actually build a GovCon business because the government's old. Okay. The government is not Amazon. They, they do not understand a lot of stuff. They have a process and a procedure. They have a way that they want things done. You cannot just write up your quotes the way that you want them like you normally would and say, here you go, contracting officer. They'll say, thanks, <laughs> throw it away. You do stuff the way that we want it. Okay. Like that's, that's how the game is going to be played. So, you know, this is how you play the game, these five things. So, um, with that being said, I'm probably getting a little too passionate at this point. So I will uh, digress. I'll take a drink and um, I'll turn the rest of our time over to the comments because I don't have anything else I want to cover. So let me see what's going on. Thanks for sticking with me, guys. I, I love hanging out with you. Um, with every successful YouTube live we have, it makes me want to do another. So um, my goal is to keep growing these and get uh, more and more folks involved because, hey, it's better than watching a pre-recorded YouTube video sometimes, right? Um, I like it. It's fun for me. So um, yeah, just, you know, genuinely and seriously, thanks for being here and hanging out. Like, um, I know I'm pretty much a nerd, but I do, you know, I do enjoy stuff. I guess that makes you guys nerds too, if you're here. So <laughs> cheers to the nerds. Um, Uh, let me see. Jessica Hefner. Let me pick up from Jessica Hefner. Hello, I've been watching all your videos and finally uh, got to watch you live. Awesome. You helped me tremendously with starting government contracting. My boss threw me at it and I knew nothing. Oh my goodness. That's, I'm so glad that some of the information was able to help you. I can't imagine. I've heard of other folks kind of being just their boss wants them to learn to get into government contracting. Um, I've received that feedback in other places and they're just like, I don't even know what to do, where to start. So um, I really appreciate uh, you being able to jump in today and, um, you know, saying some stuff helped you. That's awesome. Let's see what else we got. Uh, Miladies and uh, Eliza Marrero, I am already registered with Sam. Cool. And I got my duns. I'm waiting on my cage. Cool. I am a new freight broker and I need to learn how to bid on those contracts. So um, just like most of the stuff I say, I don't have anything sexy to say about this other than you need to identify PSC codes, NAICS codes that you are able to see um, freight opportunities under. So um, if you go to Google, you type in SBA NAICS, so N-A-I-C-S, SBA NAICS, it will pull up a table. You can download that. That will give you a list of all the NAICS codes. And then also if you go into Google and you type in product and services codes, that will take you to a website called acquisition.gov. You can download an Excel table that has all of the PSC codes. So now you have some areas that you can search by like keywords for like freight and, and things like that, transportation, trucking, logistics, right? Get a short list, take that over to beta.sam.gov. On the right side in beta.sam.gov, contract opportunities will be your, your uh, search results. On the left-hand side, you will have your filters. Go to the NAICS code area, the filter, put in next codes, start running searches, go to product and service codes, um, put in your PSC codes there, start running searches. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, third search, delete all that out. Just go into the keyword section where you can actually type something in and type in, you know, freight, trucking, logistics, that will start showing you some stuff in the research search results that may be related to what you're trying to find. Um, and then you can kind of uh, be all downhill from there and really try to hone in on the agencies that are really buying this type of this type of service. This is the method. Hey, this isn't just trucking, guys. This is the method that you can use for finding anything. If you if you have a good or a service and you don't know how to find it, use this same practice example for whatever it is you are trying to um, find to bid on. OK, so I hope that helps. Uh, I watched the movie War Dogs and got inspired. Uh, from Eddie 2020. Yeah, uh, me too. I watched that movie for the first time probably three years after um, joining my government contractor that I worked for where I, you know, did everything. Um, I like sat on my seat and I was like, holy crap, like this is so much of it was relevant and relatable to what I was doing. 
Um, maybe even a little bit of the crazy stuff in that movie I could relate to a little bit. We won't get into that. But uh, yeah, that movie's uh, hilarious, I think. It really hits home. I need to watch that again. Um, SSS, WWW, welcome back. I remember, uh, I remember your name from a previous YouTube Live because it was three S's and three W's. Um, you're doing a great job, man, and keep uh, keeping it straightforward. My question for this week is how to get prior uh, performance. Should I be focusing on microtransactions and unison bidding at first? You absolutely could. Um, if you want to gain and build your past performance, uh, good question. A question I get a lot. Um, again, you don't necessarily have to. So assuming that this is something that you want to do, um, you, you can start small. You could, you could start by going under simplified acquisition. Those contracts are easier to get. You could do uh, micro purchases, credit card purchases, but a lot of those come from uh, marketing. So you would have to have that conversation with like a small business liaison at the Ostabu, or you could do some sort of marketing strategy email campaign. Um, that's one of the things I'm building into that big program that I'm working on. I've got email scripts, call scripts, uh, campaigns that you can run. So that's something that you could do if you wanna be a bit creative um, to kind of solicit those smaller type procurements. The only thing that I would say is if you're really wanting to build the past performance, um, you should build relevant past performance because if you're trying to like do one thing, but you're, you're going after these smaller things to build your past performance, right? But if those things are not related to that bigger thing you're ultimately trying to do, it's kind of just a waste because it's not um, relevant and past performance has to be relevant in order to be used. Subcontracting is always a, a, a good form of, of building past performance, but I've talked about this a number of times recently. There are inherent risks associated with it. And my stance is just that you don't have to have the past performance all the time. Not, as I said, not all the solicitations require it. Many do, not all of them do though. So you could just look for those that um, don't require it if that's something that you're having trouble getting around. But your question was, that you want to build past performance. So honestly, um, aside from going from those after those small transactions, because they might not even be relevant, uh, being a subcontractor is a, an excellent way to build past performance. Like I said, when I always talk about it though, I just say you don't always need it, but if it's something you want to do, you can, um, that's kind of the, the best way to do it. Unison bidding, Unison Marketplace. Uh, you can go to Google, type in Unison Marketplace, it's a third-party site similar to beta.sam.gov. Create your username and email, log in. It'll show you a few hundred bids um, that you could bid on. Most of them are goods though, commodity items, parts and pieces. You may see a, a few service type things in there. Um, so if that's the type of, of business you're wanting to build where you're delivering goods, Unison Marketplace is an excellent past performance builder for that model but it may not be the best past performance builder for something like, you know, staffing or construction or, or whatever. I mean, maybe if you can deliver some construction equipment, maybe you could use something like that if it's a small contract job, but uh, for like IT and cyber or, you know, environmental, so many, you know, telecom, so many things you could get into with GovCon, it's not going to be exactly relevant. Um, you know, audiovisual type stuff, although you might be able to find some audiovisual equipment. So, um, but yeah, for those of you who don't know Unison Marketplace and you think you might be into to goods, go ahead, go to Google, type in Unison Marketplace, take two seconds to create an account, nothing to register, um, and then you'll be able to see all the bids. However, that's a reverse auction. It's a race to the bottom. It's not the same as beta.sam.gov. So just know that it's a reverse auction. Um, so it's heavily on the lowest price. Moving on, um, Kyle Harris, I'm in the same situation, still waiting on my cage. Yeah, um, not Kyle, uh, Kai, Kai Harris. Um, that's awesome. I, I say while you're waiting, Kai, just uh, start doing your research. Should be doing research every day or every other day, at least a few times a week. Um, Beta.sam.gov. Find those agencies that are actually putting out the requirements for the thing that you want to provide, okay? And then if you don't even know what that thing is, do that first step of got to start with something. So you might as well start with some NAICS codes or some PSC codes, start with those, plug those in, and then see what results get brought up. Um, something sexy, but it's it's fairly effective. And it's probably the, the best way that I'd recommend to go about doing it. 
So um, let me see here. Alex, ma'am, congrats. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. I'm working my, my way down here, guys. Eddie 2020, campers are badass. They, they sure are. Um, they get hot, though. <laughs> I'm sitting here because I got my AC off because I can't hear myself talk over the AC, so I'm sweating bullets right now. Can't wait to move. S-O-B-C. I just sent a request to join your Facebook. I look forward to joining and learning. Awesome. Welcome. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, closed group, so I do review those requests. Um, pretty much everybody gets in, though. So uh, I will be checking and approving that request probably on my phone when I get off this call. I don't have some secret person who does it. It's all me, guys. It's just me. <laughs> and my uh, my awesome girlfriend helps out a lot. So always give her some love and shout out. Um, she helps me more than anybody with this. And I drive her crazy. I drive her crazy with this. Um, we have... Uh, I'm going to do my best to pronounce the name. Aditamiwa... We'll go with we'll go with that. Uh, can you narrow the, the search word down to a certain area of the world? So uh, good question. And um, what you can do in beta.sam is you can have a search, but then within the filters in beta.sam, you can do a, a geographic type thing. And I, I believe that the geographic input that it allows you is a zip code which I have not had a lot of luck with. So they'll have a, a geographic filter or um, may just be like place of performance in beta.sam within the filters. And if you're not seeing it within those filters, you can uh, go, there's a thing at the top that's like more filters or more options and that will give you more stuff and you can check it and then that will include that in. So if you're not seeing it, check the more options. Um, check for something that's geographic related or uh, place of performance. Although I don't think the results are great, but it is my best answer to your question. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, Ryan350, uh, looks like he wants to talk about certs. 8A, service disabled, going on 10 contracts now, nine of which closed out. Thanks for all the great advice. Um, oh, you're saying that you're 8A service disabled. Uh, awesome, Ryan. Um, if you are 8A service disabled, thank you for your, your service. And um, thanks for joining us on the channel. Uh, I'm trying someone with your videos to search beta.sam.gov. Thanks again. Yeah, um, it just takes a little bit of a uh, repetition, a little bit of exercise searching on beta.sam. And if you are 8A service disabled, just remember there is that set aside filter within uh, beta.sam. So if you're woman owned, if you're 8A, if you're veteran owned or service disabled veteran owned um, or hub zone, there is a set aside filter where you can search for contracts that are just for that set aside. So that's maybe something that you can do if you're not doing that already. Um, Jeff Fennell, my question is, I'm in facilities maintenance and Jeff, a uh, shout out to Jeff. Um, I don't remember if we've had a call or just some emails in the past, Jeff, but I definitely recognize your name from a while back. So shout out, thanks for um, sticking, sticking with me for this long. Uh, he's asking, uh, he's in facilities maintenance, but I want to buy items for the government as well. How do I use that with a CAPE statement? That's a really good question. I, I love talking about this. I'll spend just a second on this. Um, so for those of you who want to do kind of more than one thing, meaning maybe provide a service and a good or provide you know several different types of goods, what I recommend when it comes to marketing your business whether it's creating a CAPE statement, creating a website, what have you, I recommend you find something to create an umbrella. So you want to create an umbrella, almost think of like a parent company, even though you know, you're know you just gonna have one company, you're not going out setting up several businesses. One business, same business, don't change anything. But think like you would in a, a parent company with different verticals, different divisions. So um, the common, kind of the most common uh, umbrella that I recommend that folks seem to like is professional services. They say, I'm in professional services. Well, I mean, hell, that could be anything, right? Like, so it's it's an umbrella, but I mean, professional services probably, there's certain things that probably wouldn't be included in that. And there's things that make more sense to be included in that. So it's a little bit restrictive in that nature. But other than that, um, you know, maybe you're thinking of like white collar, if you're thinking professional services, 
Um, obviously, blue collar is extremely professional services also. So I'm not saying anything against that, but um, try to think of an umbrella. So for, for you, Jeff, you're, you say you're in facilities uh, maintenance, um, but you want to provide equipment. I mean, you could, facilities actually is the umbrella, one of the umbrellas that I, I recommend. Um, so if you say that you're in facilities management, I mean, you, providing services as well as goods that help with the facilities that actually fits quite nicely underneath that facilities umbrella. Um, if you don't like that, or if you want more broad, or maybe use something that's more of the, the government's lingo, um, base ops. This is another umbrella that I've, I've it took me a while to come up with these words, guys, but they're things that I've seen and I identify them as being effective. Um, so just through my experience, I picked these up. Um, so base ops, base operations, is, a, is it also another good umbrella that that would fit facilities as well as goods that could you know support the base. So my recommendation to you would uh, choose an umbrella to basically be the, the frame for your CAPE statement or your website, whether it's facilities or base ops or whatever, and then kind of intuitively um, and organically and naturally add those services. Because it's okay to say you do one, two, three, and four in your CAPE statement. That, that's totally fine. As long as it ties back to the overall main theme, it's going to make sense. So um, thanks for that question. I think that applies to a lot of folks, and I love answering that. Steve Dams uh, says, awesome. Thanks for the answer. You got it. Uh, Eddie2020, he got me when he said free. <laughs> uh, yeah, everybody. The problem with free is that there is a price perception, and it's one of the things that uh, I am dealing with, although I have my courses set to free. Because of the price perception of free, some folks think that think that there's no value, right? Or I'm just trying to get your email. You know, those of you who are on my email list, I email you once a week, um, and some people still unsubscribe, and, and like that's that's totally fine. Anybody that doesn't want to be on the email list shouldn't be. But um, like, I'm not. There's no gotcha with the courses, and the courses are free. So there's that pricing misconception. Since I have them free right now, a lot of folks think that there's there's no value. But realistically, each of those courses, in my opinion, is probably 100 to $150 worth of value, partly because there's so much misinformation out there. And then also, um, there's just a lack of information amongst the misinformation. So it's just hard to find this info. But um, again, I'm trying to build a relationship with you. That's why I have my courses set to free. Um, I'm trying to make you guys into fans of mine so that you'll support me on future endeavors. Um, cause I, I will need your support. This is my full-time job, right? This is not a, a charity for me. So I'm, I'm trying to, I'm taking the step forward to, to provide you the value to, to be able to do the things that you should be able to do to make decisions about government contracting without having to invest a whole bunch of money, right? So like that information I believe should be standard, but too many folks are charging a lot of money just to get that info. And I don't think that's fair. So that's, that's why I'm trying to, to, you know, change the paradigm a little bit around what what government contracting should be um, and the amount of info that people should have in order to make a decision. So um, don't get me started on free. <laughs> uh, yeah, great show. Me, I get it uh, from the Fred and, and Alexander. Yeah, uh, referring to Gold Rush. I love that show. I haven't watched it in years. Um, Steve G, can someone who is not living in America but has an LLC in the U.S. bid and win contracts so, um, yeah, I'm not an expert in this area. I do have a level of ignorance when it comes to this, but I can share with you what I do know. Um, and that is if you are outside the country, um, you're registered in, in the U.S. though with an LLC. So this may not even apply to you. I know for folks that are outside the country, as long as you're in a, a NATO part participating country, that's, you know, participates with uh, North America as part of NATO, uh, the agreement, then um, instead of getting a cage code, you would get what's called an N cage code, which is a NATO cage code. And if you type in N cage code and Google, um, that'll pull up a tool and kind of get you started for doing that. However, I don't know if that even applies to you if you're already um, registered in LLC. Um, I don't I don't know how that affects you if, because you're just talking about residing outside the country, but your business is within the country. 
Um, I, I think you're probably even more able to do that. I think a lot of it will probably depend on, you know, how you plan to perform the contracts um, and where you live. Uh, I don't want to, you know, I don't have the best answer, but I think you can definitely do it. Um, that's not to say that there's not some things you have to, to jump through, but um, if you contact the federal service desk, if you type in federal service desk into Google or you go to sam.gov, they have the info for the federal service desk. They answer questions. They even have a international line, like a 1-800 number for folks outside the U.S. And they're very knowledgeable. Um, I would recommend you to them as a resource. Um, Jeff says, uh, yes, so true. And Ryan says, yes, great analogy with the gold rush for sure. Glad that you um, you uh, resonated with that. And Steve says, love your energy. Thank you so much, Steve. I do get a kick out of doing these. Um, thank you guys for you know staying for the whole hour and ten minutes. It, you guys, you guys energize me. You guys, you know, motivate me. Kai Harris says you motivate me. You guys also motivate me. So, um, Pam Knighton says my local PTAC office is valuable resources. Also, so yeah, Pam, um, PTACs have a lot of information and they help a lot of folks. Um, and for those who are at the early stages, they're just trying to find their way. Maybe they're not registered yet, or maybe they just got newly registered. Um, PTACs can be a, a great resource. Every county is supposed to have a PTAC. If you go to Google, um, PTAC, Procurement Technical Assistance Center, um, these are free places. You can actually go brick and mortar places you can go to, to get help. Um, however, every PTAC I find is a little bit different. Um, when it comes to the resources after getting registered, I know that they have some some workshops, some one one type classes that can be beneficial after that. It's been my experience. You're kind of on your own. Um, I've, you know, I've been to many PTACs myself and that's kind of been my takeaway. So um, I, I do believe PTACs have a, have a place and they can help a whole lot at the early stages. So um, I agree with you. Um, thanks a lot from uh, Miladies and Eliza Marrero. You are welcome. Um, we have uh, NJ Mommy. Shipley's website states that they help with the RIN rate for U.S. government contracts and commercial contracts. So, yeah, that's awesome. Um, it's great to hear that they have something for the commercial contracts that I was referring to and that they have something for government contracting. Um, so we, we talked about that earlier in uh, the session. Someone asked the question about what I think about Shipley. I said that they're the gold standard. They are the ones that are extremely comprehensive and thorough. Um, I also said that I'm not Shipley certified, but I am somewhat familiar with the, the method and the process and that um, for super small business owners, I don't know exactly if it would be overkill or I don't know about the pricing, if it would be relevant. Um, just that I know that you don't need it. You definitely don't need it, but uh, if you have a, a way to get it or something, it doesn't hurt to add to your arsenal. So um, thank you, uh, NJ Mommy, for providing that feedback. Um, and Pam says, looking forward to the program launch. Thank you, Pam. Yeah, there'll be more information to, to follow on that. It's going to be more like, like a college level like course. Um, probably only going to have enrollment like twice a year. So it's going to be one of those things where um, we'll have classes that go through it. Um, that way it gives me time to get feedback and improve. Um, and that way everybody's kind of going through it at the same time. So I think that'll be a really cool, exciting thing. Um, look look for that in 2021. That's going to be about my whole year next year is going to be about. Once I get moved, um, it's like 110% of everything I'm doing is going to be on getting that launched. Um, hopefully at the beginning of next year. So um, thanks. Uh, Marcus Jones has great information. Thank you, uh, LC. If you are a startup. What do you put under past performance? I did already at answer that question. So for the interest of time, um, uh, I, I did talk about kind of past performance. So just go back. Um, this will be live. This will be available on my channel and you can watch the replay. Um, how do we refine our target market list? The way you do it is um, I, I recommend having three to five target agencies, which are the agencies that spend probably the, the most is that the number one uh, parameter those agencies that spend the most on what it is you're trying to sell, goods or services. If you go to usaspending.gov, click the advanced search dropdown, and, um, or I believe it's award search dropdown, there will be an advanced search option. Open that up, go over, and this is in one of the courses too, um, on what should you sell to the government. I show you how to do this, but uh, click advanced search within that, 
go over to the, the filter on the left, type in NAICS code just like you would in um, beta.sam. It'll bring you up search results just like you would, except you're in USA Spending now. And then toggle over to the, the uh, I believe it's targets. It's, it's the filter all the way on the right. Um, you'll have map, you'll have a, a table, and uh, that will show you the agencies that spend the most for this particular NAICS code. So again, your question, how do we refine our target market list? Identify the top three to five agencies that are spending the most for your NAICS code. Um, that's probably not a bad place to start because you can follow the money. Again, I go over this in my course of how to uh, USA spending, um, what should you sell to the government? But uh, go over to USA spending advanced search, put in that NAICS code, and then look for those, uh, I forget what that thing is called, uh, it's the filter all the way on the right. And it will, uh, oh, it's called category select category and then it will show you the the agencies that are spending the most for the next code and then it'll give you option even to click uh sub agency when you click sub agency it will actually break down for example the dod department of defense is an agency but if you click sub agency it will show you the spending by army air force and navy so it shows you those sub agencies once you've done that take that with a grain of salt with your geographic area see what low hanging fruit is in your, your region, places that you can visit, you know, market, you know, we talk about marketing as important as bidding. So um, find where the most money is being spent and then find those areas that you can reasonably get to or market to um, geographically. I think that's the best way to refine your target market list. Uh, Ryan says, I was able to get past performance through a prime contractor as a sub. Absolutely, that was kind of what I was saying. You don't have to. But if you choose to, um, uh, being a sub is probably the most effective to build past performance. Again, it's just not something you always have to do, but it is very, very effective. It's basically the best way to do it. Um, Natural QT says, do you recommend bidding on contracts out of your state of residence? Um, good question. Interesting question. Um, depends on what industry you're in. If you're in construction, well, do you, do you just have like one crew? And if you're in Michigan, like, how are you going to get to Utah if you win a contract in Utah? So, you know, I wouldn't recommend that. You know, if you were in something that requires you to be geographic or requires you to have a, um, you know, a representation, maybe even you have to have a 50 mile radius. Some contracts will state that you have to have that. Um, so it really depends on your industry something like staffing or, or other types of services, you can provide the same level of service in all 50 states without any really any hiccups. I mean, other than time zone changes, um, there's going to be uh, different you know, tax rates and things like that for employees that are in different states. Um, with that in consideration, if you can get over that hurdle, you're not restricted. So um, I do recommend it as long as it fits the, the niche and the GovCon model that you're using for your business. <clears throat> Alexander, thank you so much for your help, girlfriend. <laughs> yes, uh, thank her so much. Uh, I agree. Thank you for giving her some credit. That's hilarious. And um, she's probably listening right now. Um, and if she she missed it, I'll let her know that you said, thanks, Alex. I appreciate it. Uh, Ryan, I had zero luck with the zip code filter. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. Um, I don't have... Great luck with it either, as I was trying to say. It's just one of the only things that I know exist. Um, so really, that's why I put in my course for finding the low-hanging fruit. Like I will literally pull up Google Maps and I'll start looking and typing different agencies to see what's in my area since there's not a great tool for finding something that's geographic. Um, one thing I know that they are working on, though, um, in that same USA Spending award search, advanced search, run the next code, and then go to a uh, category. They have um, agency and then sub agency, but they're working on a third category. And it's, it's a uh, like contract office or something like that. So they are working on providing that data, that information. So they'll actually be able to show based on that next code, that, that search that you, that you run whenever they get around to uh, finishing the update for USA spending, They'll be able to show the different locations, the different contract office uh, IDs. At least that's my understanding. I haven't spoken with them, but that's kind of what that's looking like. Um, and that's a huge need and it's something that's very much missing. So I'm guessing 
that's the uh, problem they're trying to solve with that. So once that's done, I think that will be the number one go to um, to answer that question. So thanks for uh, kind of fact checking that and um, giving me that feedback as well, because that's kind of been my experience. Um, Jeff, I know, OK, thanks. You're the best, Jeff. Yeah. Thanks for sticking with me for so long, man. I definitely recognize you. I appreciate it. Sheena, what's going on? Sheena P. Um, also facility support services. I found a lot of stuff falls under that, including construction, janitorial, uh, janitorial and landscaping. Exactly. So as facility support services, as an umbrella, you can put certain types of construction. You can put custodial, janitorial, landscaping, um, base ops is, is another thing that you could put under that, you know, you know, including, um, yeah, like landscaping, I was going to say mowing or snow plowing, stuff like that, even like, like courier services, you know, if you if you can staff like a, a postal person on base, or somebody who's, um, you know, in logistics, that's transporting stuff on base, all these things can fall under facilities, or base ops. So thanks for that. Um, that uh, acknowledgement, Sheena. So uh, SOBC says, have you seen the story about the 16 year old kid winning government contracts? He's got ideas from watching Ward Lords. Um, I have not heard about a 16 year old kid and winning government contracts because I don't believe he's old enough to win government contracts. Um, if you have a link or a resource for me to check out, I'd be more than happy to do that because I got started when I was 26 and I thought I was young. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't think legally anybody could do anything when they're 16. Yeah, War Dogs seems to be a, a huge driver for folks, Sheena, getting into this. Um, it's a great flick. Uh, I love um, Jonah Hill's character. Um, he He's such a kind of like a badass in it, and he just doesn't care. And I think that's the part where he, uh, well... I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but like he pulls like some guns out of the trunk um, and scares some people off. It's kind of funny. That's, that's a good movie. Um, the value of the free course I've completed so far is amazing. Learn a valuable foundation, GovCon. Pam, thank you so much for that. Um, I appreciate you acknowledging the value. I do put a lot of work into what I do. Um, it's really uh, what I hang my hat on. I can't go to sleep well at night if I just don't do a good job on something. Um, so I really do uh, appreciate that. Uh, and that's solid. People are out here ch uh, charging $1,000 for capability statements. That's nuts, Sheena. I haven't, Sheena, I have not heard 1,000. I've seen like four or 500 and then my jaw just dropped. Um, I think I have some pretty decent looking capability statements. And, um, you know, if you go to govkidmethod.com, I've got within the courses, you can get cape statements. They're, they're 50 bucks and you get all of them there. You know, you can change out the photos, but I try to give you a somewhat of an assortment. I know not everything's there for everybody, but it's hard for me to make every type of Cape statement out there. Um, for 50 bucks, I think you can have something that looks pretty, pretty dang good. And a um, thousand dollars is just outrageous. Absolutely outrageous. What if my contract, uh, the Fred says, what if my contract POC is not responding um, who is your POC? Cause there's kind of three contract POCs. You have your, your contracting officer, uh, the Fred, you have the, your contracting officer's representative, and you may also have some sort of PM. Um, so since you have at least, I know you have at least two of those, maybe three. So if the one is not responding, I would try to contact the other. Um, and especially if you're having issues, uh, like something's urgent or whatever, you should definitely be trying to contact the other. Um, if not, they do take vacation. Sometimes they change jobs, in which case there could be kind of a gap in service. You may get a, a new introduction. Say if one contracting officer makes a lateral or a, a vertical move to change a job or something, someone will backfill his or her position. Um, and sometimes they're not always the best at telling you that. Something like that could be going on. I'm just not sure. You're, uh, Fred, you said you emailed both about the shipment delay and no responses. Um, you could go to the, you could go to the Ozdebu, you could go to the small business office, a small business liaison. That office typically knows most, if not all, of the contracting officers. Um, so you could do that. Um, that would be my recommended 
next or if you wanted to do something a uh, little out of the box creative honestly it's something i would do um since you since you know who uh you know the agency and the contracting office find a different contracting officer literally go on beta.sam find the bids that are coming out of that office find a different contracting officer with his or her name on a, another bid and start contacting them you know so if 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 your person who's missing is is bob call or contact this contracting officer and say, Hey, I have an existing contract. Um, I need Bob. Where's Bob? <laughs> like, where did Bob go? I would start bugging the other contracting officers. Um, especially if it's something that's urgent. I've done that like twice where I couldn't get a hold of them. And I usually they're like, Oh yeah, he's sitting right here. <laughs> you know, he's been ignoring you or, um, Oh yeah, he's on vacation and he'll be, or she's on vacation and she'll be back in a, a week. Sometimes that, that helps. Uh, yeah, where's Bob exactly? Um, so let me see. We got a few comments left here, guys, and then we'll be uh wrapping up for the day. Um, thanks everybody for uh sticking with me here. Maybe that's a stupid question, but is there any contracts paying up front? Not to my knowledge. Um, I know that there's like grants and like foundations, um, not to be confused with like true hardcore govcon um grants and foundations they'll like award money and then you'll go out and you'll like do a study or you'll do a thing and you'll provide that back to the foundation and then based on your results they may keep funding you so for those type of things i'm knowledgeable that they do provide money up front but for everything i talk about federal government contracting true government contracts it's typically always you know net 30 um, or progress payments, depending on the type of contract. So um, that's for you, Steve. Uh, yeah, um, Ryan, Ryan350, I think I skipped over you. The courses are amazing. I was actually surprised you're not charging. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, it's, it's my, my way of building goodwill and also um, trying to help during all the BS that we're going through this year. If you watched my, my Easter video, I, I talk about why I decided to do that because they were not always set to free, but um, it was a decision that I, I made. Um, so yeah, I appreciate I appreciate you acknowledging that and the value that they bring. I do appreciate that a lot. Steve G, do you need a, a social security number in order for WAF to process your receipt and pay you? Um, I don't get a whole lot into WAF, Steve. I don't know if it's something that you, someone else asked about WAF earlier. I don't know if it was still you. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, cause everything I know is it's tied to a, a tin and an EIN. So I'm not a hundred percent about an SSN. Um, I am not bidding government contracts right now. You know, like I don't ever try to give that, that skew. So I can't just like go into WAF right now. Cause I don't have an account. Cause in order to be in WAF, you have to have that stuff set up and ongoing. I'm full-time coaching. I'm full-time consulting. Um, so everything I have, I pull from my, my experience and my background. Um, I believe everything is tied to a TIN or EIN, but if you're having a technical issue, um, Steve G, um, your, your POC is your contracting officer. And, uh, if you're having trouble with WAF, uh, that's what I would recommend. Um, again, everything I focus on is on winning the contract. So that's why I don't talk a whole lot about registering, but even more, it's why I don't talk about the after stuff after you win the contract like you know uh going into the nuts and bolts of, of how to how to invoice and all that type of stuff i'm not going to be going into that um it's probably a great space for somebody else in govcon to form i mean i would be a great relationship to, to pair up with them because my focus is on getting you guys to win contracts um you can always rely on contracting officers and pocs to help uh, get questions you know answered but in my opinion, you know, for the vast majority, that's not the problem. The problem is winning the contract. So that's that's where my focus is. Um, so, uh, like I said, if you have this contract and you're having issues, your your contracting officer will help you address that. If this is something you're just trying to foresee, um, then I would kind of wonder why you're asking the question. So um, I don't know the background behind the question you're asking. So that's probably the most that I could say about it right now. Um, Pam says, you're welcome. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Diana, yes, uh, he was interviewed by Aaron Coffey, Eric Coffey. Okay, I, I do know um, 
you know, Eric Coffee. So I will try and find that. I'm sure you're referring to that 16 year old who won contracts. Doesn't sound right to me. Um, it, it doesn't, but I, I could be wrong. So um, I will I will try to check that out. Thanks for letting me know that. Um, Steve, the they pay up front in war zones in places like Afghan and Afghanistan and Iraq, but in the beginning of war. Okay, good to know. Um, for certain circumstances, like uh, war zones, that is not surprising to me uh, that they would pay up front because stuff needs to get done. So uh, I've never been in a war zone. I've never been involved in a war zone contract. So um, hey, I appreciate that. That's that's good to know. Sheena at Steve. Um, there are some local contracts that they will pay up front for material purchases meant for the job. Got it. Um, and Ryan says, got to run. Thanks again. Look forward to the next one. I got to run as well. So uh, guys, that's all the comments. That's today's topic. Really, you know, how do you win that contract? Um, we talked about an award being tangible. We talked about that one skill that you really need to focus on RFP, RFQ is responding to the solicitation whether it's from beta.sam or relationships, you got to be able to respond to it. And then we talked about those five main things that you need to be living on the, the grit, the grind that you need to, to focus on to uh, really, it's not sexy, but to focus on for a duration of time to win contracts. Um, that's my answer to how do you win a government contract? There's probably different ways to answer it, but um, that's my definition and how I would recommend. So if you didn't hit the like button on the video before you leave, hey, hit that like button. It helps me. Um, and if you aren't subscribed yet, GovCon is all that I do. Um, if you're somebody who watches a lot of my videos and haven't actually subscribed yet, hey, consider subscribing. It helps me a whole lot if you want to help me out. Getting more subscribers allows my videos to rank higher in the rankings. And I want to be number one in the space. Um, and I'm currently not. <laughs> So um, your subscription would mean a lot to me uh, if you want to consider doing that. Uh, if not, you know, um, keep hanging out. It's all good. I appreciate everybody's um, appreciate everybody's uh, playing full out during this this live session. I'm planning to do another live. I will plan to do another live next Friday. So uh, watch the Facebook group, watch for emails, or just uh, watch for the notifications if you hit that notification bell. Um, you'll, you'll be notified when I go live. If you want to come hang out again next Friday, same time, same place here in the camper. I'll see you guys. Uh, I'll see you soon. Hopefully next week.